Okay, uh, so in this video lecture, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the keystone species concept and follow up on that video that you should have watched prior to, th to this about uh, some animals uh, are more equal than others. We'll move on. All right, so in that video, some animals are more equal than others. Uh, you were presented with this conundrum here, right? Look at this picture here. Why, why is it so green? If you really start thinking about it, right? Uh, uh, well, these are the producers, right? Photosynthetic producers are able to transform light energy from the sun into chemical energy in the form of glucose. And so there's a lot of food in this picture, right? So the idea is that, well, if there's so much food available, then why isn't it all being eaten by insects? Why isn't it being overrun? In fact, why isn't the whole world being overrun by insects? Right? Why, why is it that if there's so much food available that we don't have all that many more insects eating or primary consumers or whomever eating off of that food? And so it's kind of an interesting idea that was explored uh, in the video. And we found that, well, the numbers of those primary consumers or really any other organism within a food web of an ecosystem can be regulated, controlled by the predators and the other individuals within that ecosystem. Uh, and uh, so take a look here. You, you're looking at an image of an arch and right at the very top, this is called the keystone. And what the keystone does is it really prevents all the rest of that arch, all those rocks from falling down. So the idea is, is that uh, we can have these keystone species that are just as important as that keystone rock is to that arch. The keystone species, if we were to remove that keystone species like the otter that you see on our screen, uh, then, then that entire ecosystem in which that otter lives or the starfish would collapse just like those stones would. So here's a definition for keystone species. Uh, it's a lot of stuff to write down within your notes. Uh, so take a moment here. You can always push pause too. The keystone species is a species on which other organisms in an ecosystem largely depend such that if it were removed from the ecosystem, it would change drastically. Uh, it's a critical species that can have direct and indirect effects on all organisms within an ecosystem when removed, right? Think of maybe poaching or overhunting or maybe an invasive species removes that otter for us. Uh, these, that removal uh, of these tro um, keystone species can cause what are called trophic cascades when removed. Uh, an example of a keystone species would be the otter and the starfish. So, uh, right, take a look here. Uh, write this down in your notes if you wanted to. You can access the film. Some animals like it more, I'm sorry, some animals are more equal than others um, by uh, going to crjust.us forward slash otter if you wanted to watch the film again. Take a look here, I've got a food chain for us, uh, right? The kelp are the producers, uh, the, urch the urchins would be the primary consumers, and then from here the otters would be the secondary consumers, and that those um, arrows really represent the flow of energy from one of these populations to the next, right? Uh, so the removal of a keystone species will lead to trophic cascades and top-down regulation. The idea is if the otter is at the top of a trophic pyramid, uh, right, a feeding pyramid, uh, the base of which is producers at the top would be the otter, um, that, that, that removal of that otter then is going, or, or the addition of that otter is going to regulate the amounts of the individuals all throughout that trophic pyramid. Right, uh, and that removal or the addition of it is called a trophic cascade. These changes, these direct and indirect changes will flow throughout all members of the community of these organisms within the ecosystem. Uh, so let's make a prediction, right? If we were to, let's uh, put a minus over the word otter to indicate that there's a decrease of it. Let's make a prediction as to what will happen to the population of urchin. If we decrease the otter, we will increase the urchin, right? Think about it. If we have fewer otters eating all of the urchins, now the urchins will be able to reproduce in greater numbers. And so we're gonna increase their population. Now doing that is a direct result of the removal of the otter, right? Well, what happens to the kelp? This is an example of an indirect response to it. So if we're increasing the urchins 
think about it, we now have more urchins to feed and they're eating off of the producers. So if we increase the number of eaters, of primary consumers, we're gonna decrease then the number of uh, kelp of the producers in this case, right? So make a prediction, if we all increase the urchins, will decrease the kelp. And that's that indirect, right? So the otter then, the removal of the otter is indirectly influencing the producer population here by also decreasing it. So take a look, this is another example of a trophic cascade, all right? So let me read this to you. In the 1990s, ecologists Deborah Letourneau and Lee Dyer studied a tropical forest shrub called the Piper plant. And you're seeing a picture of that on the screen and the community of species of insects that live on and near the shrub. A species of ant uses the piper plant as a home by hollowing out some of its branches and building colonies inside the hollow branch cores. The ants do not eat the plant leaves. Instead, the leaves are, so think about it, right? The, the plants are just, uh, rather the ants are using the piper plant uh, only for habitat. Uh, so it's not really destroying the integrity of it, certainly the health of it. In fact, uh, they're just using it as a way to, to uh, you know, maybe get off of the forest floor to use this as a place where they can reproduce and, and live their lives, right? They're fulfilling a niche of living on with on this uh, piper plant. Now there's another population of organisms within this ecosystem. Take a look, I'm gonna go back to this. When the ants encounter caterpillars, right? So caterpillars are also part of this community. They live there too. Caterpillars are feeding directly off of the piper plants. They're the primary consumer in this case. Take a look. When the ants encounter the caterpillars or caterpillar eggs on the plant's leaves, they either eat them or kick them off. Think about it, right? Kind of like what the otter's doing in the other example. The otter is keeping the, uh, the urchin population in check. Well, in a way, then, the, the, the ant is also keeping the population of caterpillars also in check they kick them off, decreasing the population of the caterpillars, right, directly. So take a look. So Letourneau and Dyer, these ecologists, were kind of interested to see, well, what effect does uh, the ant have on the overall community structure on uh, this piper plant? So take a look. Letourneau and, and Dyer added in two beetles, uh, rather, they added beetles that eat ants, and two separate groups they measured and averaged the leaf area with the addition of the beetle and uh, without it. Uh, so think about it, right? The beetle's not normally a part of this community. The, the beetle is there only to kind of you know, destroy or, or take away that ant. Uh, Laterno and Dyer weren't going to go in with forceps and remove you know, tens of thousands of ants from this community, so they were doing it with, with the beetle. It's kind of like, think about the video that we watched, right? Dr. Payne tossing those starfish off into the ocean, um, him doing that is kind of like the beetles removing the ants from this community. And then they looked at, well, think about it, right? If the caterpillars are, um, are eating the leaf, then wouldn't they be able to see, like, what effect does the ant have on the community structure, right? If the ant was missing, the leaf then the leaf area would probably decrease over time because more and more of those leaves are now being eaten by the caterpillars. So take a look at this. I've got a question here for you, right? What is the independent variable? What's the dependent variable? What's the control group in this situation? So the independent variable is going to be either with the ant, the community with the ant, or the community without the ant. So right, ant, caterpillar, leaf, or caterpillar, leaf. What's the dependent variable? It says here in the last sentence, the groups, uh, they measured and averaged the leaf area, right? So either one group is going to have larger leaves likely, and the other group will have uh, leaves that have been eaten and consumed by the caterpillars. What's the control group? The control group is going to be the baseline. The, the, there's no change, right? So it's going to be the ants, the plants, and the caterpillars. The experimental group is going to be the one where we, well, we put a beetle in there to remove the ants so that we don't have the ants anymore. We have the caterpillars and the plants. So we're missing the ant in the other experimental group. Let's take a look at the data here. 
Actually, let's take a look at the research question. So it says, how many, how, here's a, a sample research question as to what Letourneau and Dyer might be curious about. Uh, they say, how do ants regulate the population of caterpillars living on piper plants? How do the plants regulate all members of the community on which they, they are living? Here's their data. When you see a, a data or a, rather a graph like this, the very first thing I do, and I suggest that you do too, would be to look at obviously the, the title, right? Mean leaf area per plant over 18 months, and then look at the X and Y axes. Uh, this is a strategy that we can use, the I-squared strategy. The first I in the I-squared strategy is identify. We want to uh, think about what we see. What do you see, right? Well, I, I noticed the Y-axis is referring to leaf area. The X-axis is referring to some sort of time frame that uh, moves forward, right? And then I noticed, too, that there's uh, two different lines, right? The line with the circles is the results of the control group. That's going to be the ant the plant and the caterpillar. And it looks like, the you know, without having to put in that beetle, uh, as long as the ecosystem has not been changed here, right? Think about this. Hey, it appears then that the ant is controlling the caterpillar population, right? How do I know that? Well, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and then take a look at this other one. Uh, so that we saw an increase here in one group, and then we saw a decrease here in the other group, right? So think about this group. This group is uh, no ant, so it's the caterpillar and the plant. We added the beetle to take away that ant, right? Take a look. So identify. We're identifying increases and decreases. We're looking for uh, those general uh, trends, and, and we're seeing them here. Two different groups. One's going up, and the other one is going down. So now we want to think, here's the other part of the I-squared strategy is to interpret, right? What does it mean? Okay, this is where I almost started to answer prior to this, right? So what, is, what does this mean? What are the implications? If we have ant, caterpillar, plant, right, like we do up here in this line in the unmanipulated control, um, think about it. The ant is controlling the population of the caterpillar. So as a result, the plant's leaves aren't being completely decimated right? You think about, remember the green world hypothesis from the video? Why is the world filled with all of this green? Why aren't we being overrun by primary consumers that would eat from those producers? Well, it's because they're being controlled by that ant. In this case, the ant, right? This, maybe we'll call it a keystone species. Uh, how do I know that? Well, right, let's go back to this. Interpret. What does it mean? Well, look at the other graph, right? Or look at the uh, other line over here, the one that decreased over time. This is the one that didn't have the ant. So what happened then in the, in, in the end? The caterpillars ate the leaves. So when we don't have that top-down regulation from the ant, we're seeing this result, right? A decrease in the, the leaf area, which is to say the caterpillars are eating a lot more of the plant. So um, what I'd like us to do is spend a moment. We're going to uh, record a Flipgrid, uh, Flipgrid video. All right. Um, take a look. We're trying to answer this question. We're, the Flipgrid video is going to be written in CER form. All right, so take a look. Uh, how do ants regulate the population of caterpillars living on piper plants? We're going to make a claim supported by evidence, then record it on our class Flipgrid at crjust.us forward slash leaf. I'd like you to, after you record your CER statement, your claims evidence reasoning statement, I'd like you to watch and respond to at least three other of your peers' videos, all right? Um, reach out to me through email if you're having a hard time accessing the Flipgrid and I can help you out individually. Um, and that's what I'd like you to do. Uh, finish those Flipgrid responses and absolutely watch a bunch of uh, your, your fellow peers uh, do the same thing, which is to record a CER statement discussing this question. How do ants regulate the population of caterpillars living on Piper plants. All right, see you next time.